Mm -hmm. I think we're here now, right? We're here. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, all of you, for joining today. Uh, just so many of you I know have supported in the past and uh, what we've been able to do this year with the experience of Virginia under our belts, really we've just been able to take off um, uh, in North Carolina this cycle. Um, I wanted to start um, a little bit just to share with you, um, I know many of you have had a chance to look at the videos on the site. I did wanna show you one that we just um, dropped this week um, that I thought might help you understand a little bit how this process works. Um, as Julie mentioned, we did the film shoot in June. We also went back uh, two weeks ago and got some folks that we missed the first time around. Um, and I'm gonna give you all the numbers here shortly. Um, but Julie, do you prefer if I start with the raw numbers or do you want me to go into the case study first? Um, I think the raw numbers. Okay. I, All right. I really, I think it provides a good and That's what I'm going to start with. Of everything. That's what I'm going to start with. Okay. Uh, slideshow. Okay. Can everyone see that on the full screen now? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a kind of by the numbers um, visual that I wanted to show you to really understand the impact of what we've been able to do here. So the first step in this was the film shoot that we did in Raleigh with our green screen setup, where as Julie said, we rotated in, um, in two hour blocks as many candidates as we could over a four day period. I think we ended up doing 18. So in terms of number of candidates filmed, we also had a and second wave. I don't wave. know how. We had a, a second wave of filming that we did two weeks ago because COVID interfered with our, with our first effort. So all in all, uh, we have filmed 23 North Carolina candidates, um, House candidates, Senate candidates, and then some statewide candidates as we discussed. The next piece is um, we have in-kinded video ads to candidates. Um, so these would be what we've taken, that raw footage that you see on the green screen and had our editors work their magic and then the pack through the funds that it has raised has actually made videos for these candidates and and provided to them to them free of charge so we have to date um, made 31 videos that we have inclined to the north carolina candidates the next piece of this is oops, that's not what i want uh, the next piece of this is ad buys because obviously the, the filming is super important, the actual creating of the ads is super important, but what you don't want to happen is your beautiful ad to become a tree that falls in the forest that no one sees. So it's critically important to my mission that either there be funds on the candidate side to push these ads out or that we step in as the pack in order to play that role. So this is an example here of a, a virtual knock, door knock video that we made. Um, this candidate, Amy Steele, who has been supported by 31st Street, she was actually in a situation where uh, dark money went up against her in favor of her opponent, over $200,000 in a TV spend and six mailers. Um, so the PAC stepped in here to get her up on connected TV and various other forms of digital. Um, and we did ad buys. We, we paid for the ad buys to actually push her ad out. And we get all sorts of metric reports and things like this on the different ad buys that we do. But all in all, we have put dollars behind five of the ads so far um, for candidates that we felt uh, really needed that. Brian Farkas, who you're gonna meet soon, being one of them. Um, the last piece is, is where some of the magic starts to happen. I view the pack very much as a gap filler um, I work with all of these campaigns as a consultant, and I've been embedded with these campaigns like Brian since March. We've been slicing and dicing these districts and coming up with messaging plans and polling plans and all of this stuff um, with an idea toward having this content ready to go when Brian's campaign is ready to spend money. The problem is that, um, as Jim was saying, it's so important for these campaigns to really have good financial showings that they, they need to keep the money in-house uh, for a long time to have those showings. So where I see those gaps on the consulting side, and I feel like, you know what, we need to get out there with content. I understand Brian can't spend, but we need to get content for him and we need to start pushing these things out. 
that's what we do and that's what you've seen. But we eventually get to a point in the cycle where we are now, where Brian is allowed to spend money and, and we have polling back to find out what are the most important issues to moving the voters in this district. So now what's happening, Brian hasn't even seen this ad yet, uh, but we um, were able to generate from the PACS footage, a 30 second healthcare Medicaid expansion spot that we know from the polling, the path to victory, this is the number one issue that resonated with the voters that we need to engage and move to the polls in order for Brian to win. So this spot has already been cut, it is ready to go, and now when Brian comes to us and says, okay, I'm allowed to spend money now, we're not sitting around trying to cut an ad, make an ad, it's there, it's ready to go, and we'll go live this week. Um, so Brian's campaign will pay for that ad, and they will also pay to push it out. And were not for the fact that we had this content that couldn't be happening right now. So that's um, five candidates uh, at this point have paid for their own ads generated from the content that we filmed. That's just that process is just starting and that is going to take off in a million directions this week now that candidates are spending money. Um, for those of you, we're gonna pass this around, but for those of you who like to, to more see text with the numbers, those are the raw numbers as well. Um, and I, I wanna do, let's see, sorry guys, I'm gonna go backwards here for a second. Um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is the whole magic that happens with this process. Again, being on the consultant side, being on the PAC side, this really becomes a whole process of synergy. So because of my work with Brian as his digital consultant, I'm meeting and talking with him, you know, starting in March. And we're talking about his race, his background, his bio. Because 31st Street raises the funds for me to actually go film Brian in June, I have a huge sit down with Brian before that, where we parse his whole story and all the issues that we think are relevant. We sit down, we film, and I really just do a, a, a candidate uh, documentary style interview with Brian where, we, where I prompt him about the bio things that I think we wanna highlight, the issues that we need to touch on, um, really gathering everything we can in advance of the polling, which can be a little tricky. But here's the cool part. The cool part is that when we're then forming the polling, um, I can hop in because of the relationship I had with Brian and what I know about his story to say, hey, did you know that Brian, you know, uh, played at Greenville Little League and that's really a big deal in this district? Did you know that, you know, I, I can sort of jump in with things like that and help frame that polling. And we've seen in a lot of instances where that has then come back um, when we get the results as, wow, this is the thing that's hitting off the top of the scale. And then we've got the content we've pulled together. Thing we've learned about Brian's district is that the key to winning his district is going to be winning over a, a, a key group of younger voters um, who are very interested in boldness and new ideas. And it just so happens that we have Brian on film talking about that all over the place. So we have no shortage of ads. Um, this is another example I want to show with you. Alan Wellens, who's running in the Senate. Again, we film before the polls, which can be tricky, uh, but Alan's uh, poll came back and we found out the number one issue that moved voters was education. So the PAC cut a 30 second spot for him on education. The number two issue is racial justice. So the campaign asked us, you know, there's this great story Alan shared with you about his involvement with Reverend Barber in Moral Mondays. Could you cut that into a racial justice spot for us that we could then go out with? Um, so as luck would have it, we had the story. Uh, we pulled it together this week and delivered it to Alan. And this is what it looks like. In 2013, I decided I'm going to go up to the legislature and stand up with Reverend Barber against this legislature that won't expand Medicaid. We went into the legislative building and we sang and prayed. We were all handcuffed, marched off, put in a bus, arrested for disturbing the peace. This is the time for us to stand up together as a community. We are all in it together and we better fight together. So that's just another example. You know, those of you who've sat through my uh, presentations before know that I have this field of dreams approach to organizing, which is if you build it, they will come. And so the building it is getting the footage in June. 
Um, and so many things flow from that. We're able to in-kind content. In this instance, um, you know, with our candidates unable to knock doors and hold fundraisers. Well, how did we help them? Well, we created bio videos for them as early as May that they could then push out and fundraise from, and in fact did. We made one for Ricky Hurtado. I think he raised seven or $8,000 off of it. Um, Amy Steele, her superpower in 2018 when she ran the first time was knocking doors. She can't knock doors now. So we had her look into the camera and said, Amy, let's do a virtual door knock. And she knocked, knocked, knocked. And you can go watch that on our YouTube channel. Um, so really kind of trying to fill those gaps where we can. And then, you know, when this polling comes back and we're in this moment where, okay, we just got the polls back. We need to go live now because what we know from our polling also is that our folks have low name ID. Um, we have the footage and can go in in about a matter of a day or two, cut exactly the kind of spot that we need. So that's something, you know, we, we've been, we provide that to Alan Wellens. He can go use it. We also have Senate candidates like J.D. Wooten, um, who faced in the last two weeks a character attack on him. Um, he was a little bit exposed, like Amy Steele, and that he wasn't up live yet. So we put a, a great bio video together for him um, and a great education video, which was his top issue. And we were able to take PAC funds and get him up live um, in order to counter that while his budget process gets sorted out as well. So these are just kind of the examples of, of really why I'm so proud of, of the work of this PAC. Um, and I, I can't thank you enough for the support that you provide all of us. Okay. So uh, thanks, Chris. Um, we're, I wonder if um, we should stop right here for a minute instead of going right to Brian Farkas and having him uh, talk a little bit about his campaign. Are there any questions? I, I know that Isabel had a question about in-kind donations. Is there, are there any other questions that people want to um, put in the chat right now for Chris to answer? So, because that's sort of technical. I don't want to wait till the end. What is an in-kind donation, Chris? Um, so what that is, is um, <clears throat> what, I guess what President Trump doesn't believe in. Um, when, it, I don't necessarily hand money to Brian Farkas's campaign, but by giving him a video, I've given him something of incredible value. Um, by filming him at no cost to him, I've given him something of incredible value. So the PAC has to file an in-kind report that essentially says, okay, we gave Brian Farkas a video, a bio video that cost us this much to make, and we also in-kinded a film shoot. So we divide the cost of our film shoot across everyone and it ends up, you know, maybe at a thousand dollars for each um, candidate. And so we file that report and that shows as a contribution to Brian. So what it basically means is it's free to Brian, but we're just doing the reporting that we have to do to reflect that. Okay, and here's another sort of uh, more technical question. Um, where are the ads placed okay. in, in the, this sort of targeting? If you could just go into that for a little bit. Yep. So um, I often get the question, what platforms are you on? And Brian actually heard this spiel this morning because we had a team call with him. Um, we don't necessarily focus, and this is one of the reasons I'm really pleased with the distribution work that we do. We don't say, oh, we're going on Facebook. Oh, we're going on display. We, um, the first rule of campaigning is you have to meet your voters where they are. And what we know is that before COVID, voters were spending six hours a day on their devices. We know that has increased. Um, so the next rule is beyond find them where they are on their devices is how, how does Julie consume her media differently than I consume mine? Probably very differently. Um, but I want to find if I'm trying to send Brian's ad to Julie, I'm going to try and match her on four different ways. I'm going to look if she has a Facebook. I'm gonna find her mobile, ID, her mobile phone number. I'm gonna find her um, IP home address. Um, and I'm gonna find out if she has a connected TV. So if she's watching through Roku or Hulu or any of these kind of things, her content. And I'll submit that to a matching service and the matching service will come back and say, hey, you know, they won't tell Julie by name. 
but we can get her on Facebook, we can get her on this mobile ID, and she does do connected TV. And so I will then take Brian's ad and we will serve it to Julie on all those different platforms. And the cool thing about digital, two things. One, we're only serving ads to people that we're targeting from the voter file. I know I wanna to talk to Julie, so I'm gonna send an ad to Julie. So we're not spending money on people we don't wanna to talk to. Second thing is if I don't succeed in reaching Julie, uh, say she has a Facebook, but she never goes on it, we won't get charged for that because that's it's, it's like a marshal with a subpoena. If he doesn't serve the subpoena, he doesn't get paid. So if Julie never opens her Facebook feed and scrolls through it, we don't get charged. So that's kind of the, the basic answer. And I'm happy to stay late and get into that with more detail with anyone who would like yeah, to. Yeah, we will be able to have sort of a more open-ended discussion. Um, at this point, I just want to answer one question about the contributions. All of the contributions through ActBlue go to the PAC. They, 31st Street does not have a treasury. 